Hello, everyone. Welcome to This Week in Economics with Robert Wenzel. I'm Robert Wenzel. This week, I'm taking listener questions. So let's get started. The first question is, why won't we have deflation like Japan? We are doing the same policies. Won't we get the same results? Sam writes. Why won't we have a repeat of 2010, 2020? We have persistently low inflation after doing the same policies in 2008, 2009 that we are doing now. Why would the same policies of QE and government spending lead to different outcomes? Well, Sam, first of all, as far as Japan is concerned, Japan is um, a very closed society, a closed culture. And anybody that is telling you, just based on a couple of numbers, that the Japanese have not had inflation and therefore we're not going to have inflation here, doesn't understand how significantly different the two economies could be. For example, here in the United States, I know that money market funds are used sometimes in like cash transactions. People may write a check to pay for the rent using a money market account. People may have a debit card that they can use with regard to their uh, money market account. But that's something I understand because I'm here and I see how people use money market funds. So I count money market funds as part of the money supply. I have no idea what they're doing in uh, Japan as far as that's concerned. I have no idea how, how the transactions are working. I don't understand the culture. People are telling you that they they have dramatic savings in in Japan. That may be the case, but I would have to really be there, probably spend at least a year to really understand what's going on as far as the economy. So somebody that's just looking at one piece of data here, one piece of data there, and claims to you, well, what's going on in Japan means that it's going to go on here, just doesn't understand how significant... Um, small, small little things can mean that unless you're in the culture, you're not going to, you're not going to understand. Reading a uh, translation of a Japanese financial newspaper is not enough to understand what's going on there. So they may be significant differences between the two countries that uh, suggest that what's going on there will not happen here. And unless you're there, you're not going to do it. So I would dismiss any of these people that are are looking at a small piece of data. Uh, As far as the 2008, 2009 period and beyond, that is a totally different situation than what we're experiencing now. In 2008, in October, we had a financial crash, a business cycle, boom, bust situation. We don't have that now. We had a one-year lockdown. That's an entirely different situation. In 2008, when the financial crisis hit, the stock market crashed, real estate crashed. That's typical of a boom, bust cycle. In this situation, when we had the lockdown, we had the stock market go down for a bit in February and March, but then it exploded upward and is continuing upward to this day. That's not a normal boom bust cycle. This is completely different. Further, as far as money supply increases, after the financial crisis, the annualized money growth peaked at 9.7%. This time we've had annualized money supply growth as much as 26.45%. That's roughly three times as much money being put into the economy, trillions and trillions of dollars. It's not the same thing at all relative to what was going on in uh, the uh, 2008 crisis situation and following that. Uh, In in addition, we had um, major increases in productivity, particularly in the oil sector. We had a boom in the Texas uh, oil industry, which provided lots of new oil flowing into the, into the uh, market and basically pushed oil prices down. 
that was kind of a productivity pressure on uh, commodity prices. We don't have that now. If anything, we have the opposite. We sort of have an anti-productivity situation. There are not enough workers around. Only now are people starting to uh, crank up to the uh, pre-COVID panic type economy. And we're getting a situation where the um, uh, productivity of the, of the country is really less than what it was before the uh, lockdowns set in. So we, we kind of have this anti-productivity situation. There's less supply of goods around. So this is nothing like 2008 uh, and beyond. We're in a situation where we've got uh, significant bottlenecks and the Federal Reserve printing trillions and trillions of dollars, far more than Bernanke ever printed after the 2008 crisis. So we're in a much more... Uh, dangerous situation with regard to uh, the uh, inflation environment. Uh, an anonymous uh, listener writes, the Austrian business school theory, specifically how to explain it in layman's terms to help Austrians, non-Austrian economists understand it effectively. Another idea around the same topic is how to effectively use it as an investor or trader. Well, the Austrian business cycle theory is very, very important to understand. And I'm going to devote a separate episode to that. So watch for that. That'll be coming in a future episode to understand how these booms and busts come about, what the Austrian school economists had to say about it, and uh, why it makes a lot of sense. And, and that's what I used uh, to forecast the 2008 financial crisis, which I did in real time. Check out my book, The Fed Flunks, my speech at the New York Federal Reserve, which discusses in detail uh, what I saw and how I was able in real time to uh, predict the uh, 2008 financial crisis. Um, uh, an another anonymous listener writes, uh, discuss options left to the Fed if inflation becomes too high. The Fed is really between a rock and a hard place right now because you have a situation where the money supply is exploding. If they stop printing money, what it's going to mean is the um, uh, stock market's going to crash, the real estate market's going to crash, you're going to have a traditional business-like, business cycle-like crash. That's what will happen if they really try to uh, slow the inflation. And they would they would have to increase uh, interest rates tremendously. The short-term rate I calculate, the Fed funds rate, the one that they control most closely, would have to increase to uh, roughly 5%. Right now, it's about 0.6%. So that means an increase of 4.4. Now, they may increase the uh, interest rate eventually to 1% or 2%, but that's not going to be enough. That's not going to stop the inflation that we have going as far as I'm I'm concerned. So they're in a very, very difficult situation. Um, Anonymous also writes, uh, what about the path QE money takes one once released by the Fed? That I'm gonna discuss in the Austrian business cycle theory uh, episode, because that's right up the alley. And then uh, the third question from this anonymous listener is, what happens to the job market once the CARES money expires and what that means to workers in the inflationary economy? Well. What's going on as far as the uh, curious thing is there's a lot of people that are actually earning more money or getting more money by sitting at home from the uh, various programs that are now available to the unemployment in terms of payment. So it doesn't make sense for them to, to go to work. Those run out at this point on September 6th. So I, I think you're going to start to see these people move into the uh, economy sometime in late August. And... Uh, They'll, they'll be absorbed. There's no problem. Mar market's clear. They'll, they'll be able to get jobs. Now, the question becomes, what happens in terms of wages? Will there be a little downward pressure with all these uh, new people coming into the market? That's a possibility. But the key really is you've got to keep an eye on the Fed. If they're, they're continuing to put uh, upward pressure on prices, you're just going to see a tremendous amount of uh, money 
on the side that is pushing up um, prices and wages. Uh, yeah, buddy writes, discuss the socialist calculation debate. The socialist calculation debate is very, very important because during that debate, which the free market economists won, they explain how the failure of calculation, mostly this was Ludwig von Mises and Friedrich Hayek discussing these things. They argue that in a socialist economy and in a communist society, you can't calculate the best way to produce products. Now that's a very important concept. And that's another one that I will discuss in great detail in a full episode because most people don't understand it. Certainly anybody that's a socialist or communist doesn't understand it. And it really pulls a rug from under the uh, socialist communist idea because you're not gonna have a um, major functioning at a high level economy under socialism or communism where you don't have the free markets to, uh, to adjust the prices. Uh, yeah, buddy also writes, if how, why not paper, gold, silver can be used to suppress, manipulate physical price. Okay, this is grand theory going on that there's these great manipulations in the uh, gold price and the silver markets. Here's the thing. There can be short-term manipulations of anywhere from seconds to minutes to hours. Those happen in many major markets. On the other hand, it's extremely difficult, close to impossible, to manipulate markets that are broad-based. And gold and silver are certainly broad-based. They're bought and sold in the United States, in China, in India, Russia, Europe. It's, you, you've got too many supply and demand factors for somebody to try and manipulate a market like that. Now, a central bank could come in from time to time and sell some gold, and that could put downward pressure on it. And, and that's happened in the past. But for the idea that traders can somehow manipulate it, it's not. There's all kinds of talk about um, there, there's no backing for some of the silver where there's trust and they put the serial numbers up. That doesn't make any sense. Okay. And my question to these people who think there are these grand manipulations, why are you even thinking about it? If you think the market's so manipulated, that it's always going to be pushed down by these manipulators. Why do you why do you care about gold and silver? Why are you investing in it if you're investing in it? Why would you do that if you think it's that manipulating? The point is that on a short-term basis, again, very short term, we're talking seconds, minutes, hours, gold can be manipulated, but it can't be manipulated more than that. You can manipulate a small stock over a longer period, but not something with a vast market that you um that you have now. So um, basically, I, I don't buy into this manipulation stuff. It, it just doesn't make sense. And if you look at the, the gold price, since 2000, gold has gone from roughly uh, $280 to over $1,800. Does that look like a, a manipulated market where someone's able to keep the price down? Remember, 2000 gold was roughly around $280. Today, it's just over $1,800. That is not a manipulated market. That's just a regular market. You have regular technical ups and downs like you do with any other market. Um, yeah, buddy also writes, uh, can you please discuss the debate on gold versus Bitcoin? Okay, as far as Bitcoin is concerned, I see it as, as in an unusual kind of um, inflation hedge. Right now, uh, it's going up. There's a, there's a lot of excitement around it. And it will do well as, as long as the Federal Reserve continues to pump money. But it is not a money in the sense where people are using it on daily transactions. Even these people that tell you they're getting paid in Bitcoin, they're not getting paid in Bitcoin. They're getting paid in in dollar terms. They may tell their employer, uh, some NBA basketball player is doing this. He may say, you know, I'm getting, I don't know, $500,000 a month, pay me in Bitcoin. But what they're doing is they're taking 
$500,000 and calculating every month how much it's worth in Bitcoin and giving him that much Bitcoin. Now, if he was getting paid in Bitcoin, he wouldn't say, pay me $500,000 each month in Bitcoin. He would say, pay me 10, 10 Bitcoins a month. That would be getting paid in Bitcoin. And as far as I know, nobody's getting paid that way. The Bitcoin is too volatile and uh, it would be insane for somebody to, to, to fix their pay where, where you could have swings at 30, 40% even more. And the, the other problem with Bitcoin is you don't know what the regulators are going to do with it. It's clearly uh, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen does not like Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrencies. So you don't know what's going to happen there long term. And I, I would expect it to uh, crash if the uh, Fed starts to um, tighten up money supply at any time. It's, it's not a money. It's an unusual um, inflation hedge which I guess apparently can be driven up and down by what Elon Musk says from time to time. You got to consider stuff like that. Uh, an, an anonymous uh, listener writes, central bank digital currencies about to be forced on the public. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's coming down the road and it's very, very dangerous because then, uh, especially with the central bank digital currency, you're going to have the, the ability of the... Uh, central banks to track every transaction where all your money is. And uh, most significant, I don't think people get this, it's going to be a very, very easy way to stop people from doing certain kind of purchases. Because if all your money is in a central bank digital form, it's going to be very, very easy to, uh, to track. And if they, for example, say, you know, you can't buy from this bookstore or whatever, that's it for the bookstore. Because um, if somebody spends there and the bookstore takes it in, that will be shown through the, uh, through the chain of transactions. Very, very dangerous uh, thing. Uh, another anonymous uh, listener writes, do you think people at the Fed actually believe the nonsense or, they are, or are they just doing what the banks, is, banks just tell them to do? The um, Fed economists I've talked to uh, are, are very narrow in their thinking. What they tend to do is um, understand Keynesian thought, develop all their theories there, but they don't understand Austrian school economics, Chicago school economics, uh, anything along those lines. Whereas um, in my situation, I understand the Austrian school, I understand Chicago school, monetary school, Keynesian. I, I get a broad perspective. I know how all these people are thinking, what their objections are. I know where they're wrong in their thinking. That's not the case with Fed people. The, the Fed people are people that were brought up in the system, attended colleges and universities where mainstream Keynesian economics was taught. And that's the views they have. And they have no idea of what the views are out there. They're, um, they, just, they just have no concept. It's really, really quite remarkable when you talk to them. Um, Mr. Lay writes, how would it play out if one country decided to go onto the gold standard? Um, it would be a positive for gold. I don't think it would be a, a major situation. I don't think you're going to see any major countries, the United States, uh, uh, United Kingdom, France, Britain, anybody like that going on the gold standard anytime soon. So it, it might be a small country. So it would be a, a plus for gold, but I don't, I don't think it would have uh, huge ramifications. Uh, Charles writes, what's wrong with the Wininsky thesis from an Austrian business cycle uh, perspective. Uh, Jude Wininsky was an economist who held that the um, money supply did not play a role in the uh, stock market crash and Great Depression. He argued that the Great Depression was caused because of the smooth Hawley tariffs and also increases in taxes. The smooth Hawley tariffs were bad. The increase in taxes were bad. They clearly had a negative damper on the economy but that's not accounting for everything that went on. You had very strong money supply growth throughout the 1920s that was stopped. And then you had actually a shrinking of the uh, money supply in uh, the um, 1930s. And that, that's what caused the, um, the problems. And uh, 
I, I just find it odd that uh, Winiski sort of, you know, recognizes some part of what was going on, but just sort of rejects the the money flow idea where um, where the money supply really crashed. But I'll discuss more about how those flows occur and everything in my business cycle episode. Another economist, uh, an anonymous uh, writer emails, decentralized finance, discuss crypto and whether it is a new financial paradigm or a fad. Okay, as I said, it's, it's kind of a hedge against inflation. It's very fatty when you, you have uh, different cryptocurrencies going up and down based upon what mood Elon Musk is and what he twits, tweets. You know, that's, that's not very, very sophisticated investors. Um, they're able to do this now because there's a lot of money floating around. But when the game is over, those are they're all going to drop. So, yeah, in a very significant way, it is, it is a fad. Uh, Suri Juris writes, how does one hoist and carry a heavy backpack full of gold and silver bullion around from refugee camp to refugee camp, possibly at bayonet point? without injuring oneself. What is the best type and brand of bad backpack? Well, I think uh, Suri Juris is being uh, uh, facetious here. And I think he's trying to argue that Bitcoin is better or other cryptocurrencies are better because they uh, allow you to move things without having to physically carry it around. But here's a couple of things to take note. If you have a backpack full of gold coins, that is a serious amount of money. And you're not going to end up in a refugee camp. It's not going to happen. You can, you'll be able to bribe a lot of people with that. And the whole idea with any amount of gold is when things are really bad, really oppressive. And, you know, you got to bribe a border guard or somebody else from keeping you, uh, trying to push you on a train to uh, some kind of concentration camp. You know, you've got the gold to pay them off. And, and those kind of, uh, border guard situations that much more they would be much more willing to take gold than they would Bitcoin or uh, cryptocurrencies where the potential for tracking is very very real the um, the gold uh, is is a safety ticket and that's one of the places you would use it so and especially if you've got a backpack full you're not going to end up in a refugee camp uh, anonymous writer writes I would love a good breakdown of Biden's tax plan. You hear from Kamala Biden on the uh, idea that it is time the rich pay their fair share. I would love to see a breakdown on what percentage of income tax collected is already paid by those making over 400,000 compared to the new tax plan. Well, the details really haven't come out with, with regard to the new tax plan, so we can't really discuss it. Um, but it's important to keep in mind there's many, many kinds of taxes, including the inflation that we're experiencing now. That's kind of a tax. It really hurts people that are on fixed incomes, people whose salaries do not adjust very quickly. I'm thinking of, you know, a librarian or something like that. There are all kinds of people who are uh, sort of the last people to get the new money and they're being taxed and they're usually low income people. So, so the idea that the tax is that taxes are only with all this Biden government spending are only going to hurt the, the top people. That's, that's incorrect. In addition to the fact that taxing the top people uh, is taxing a lot of creative people who know how to use capital. So you're taking capital away from the people that are most creative. It does not make any sense. Closet um, Rothbani writes, how do we fight the vaccination? Okay. That's a vaccination question. This is, this is an economic show, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get into that one. Uh, another anonymous uh, listener writes, "How will gold and silver play when a central bank digital currency is introduced?" I, I would think gold and silver would um, would increase because people are gonna want to be able to have some kind of money, some kind of medium of exchange that can be used in a way that a central bank digital currency would not. Um, so you're probably gonna see strength there, hidden gold and silver. 
Uh, Eric writes, why do deficits matter? Um, I think a lot of people get wrong what the significant thing is with deficits. A lot of people think about it as well. If we borrow money now, it's going to hurt our grandchildren. They're going to have to pay it back. And there might be some truth to that, but the government is always borrowing. They just may borrow more money to keep the um, debt rolling. But the real problem is the here and now, because when the government borrows money, that is crowding out the private sector. So there's less money going to the sector that is creative, that is creating products and services for us. It's going to the bureaucracy. So that's the real problem. It's a crowding out of the creative people. It lowers the standard of living. And that's going on right now as the deficits increase. Uh, Question writes, I'd like to hear more of the details of the petrodollar recycling. For instance, is what is the motivation for OPEC countries to price oil in dollars? What are the weak points in the scheme that could easily uh, push it down? Okay, uh, Austin, basically the petrodollars was, was uh, formed because of US muscle, um, getting the Saudi Arabia government to accept dollars for all their oil sales. When that happened, it became important for countries around the world to hold dollars so they had money available when they needed to buy um, oil. And uh, some of that was is recycled by the Saudis buying treasury bills and all that when they get all the payment for the um, for the oil. Now, could that break apart? Yeah, sure. Depends upon the relationship between the United States and, and Saudi Arabia. And then you're getting other countries like China and Russia uh, who have substantial oil production who are now setting up alternative non-dollar based uh, uh, oil payment methods for their oil. So it's, it's sort of slowly cracking down, uh, breaking apart anyways. And if it, if it did break down completely and Saudi Arabia no longer accepted the dollar, well, that would be another serious problem for the dollar in terms of it as, as a reserve currency. I don't really see that happening necessarily in the short term, but it is, it is a, a threat out there, especially again with China and Russia working on alternatives for oil purchase in, in other um, currencies. Uh, Alex Zugel writes, please explain how the government securities markets operate in relation to government expenditures. Would like to understand the bureaucratic machinations and how currency units follow from monetization to end users. How newly created currency flows from the Fed to the government what in the government, where in the government first lands, and how it is distributed from agency to agency. I have a perfunctory understanding, but do not know who decides how the funds go from agency to agency. And finally, to where it is ultimately allocated for whether a defunds contractor or a um, stamp recipient. Okay, so that is basically uh, something I'm gonna discuss in the uh, Austrian business cycle episode. And uh, be sure to tune into that when I do cover that, because basically what, what it's, it's a very important topic to understand the business cycle. And it really is all about money flows, the money that the Federal Reserve creates and where it goes in the economy. So watch for that. That'll that'll be up at some point in the near future. Now, there's one more uh, question I want to touch on, and that was sent to me by email. By, let's see here, Bob Strohecker, and he writes, my question is, what are externalities? Many of my friends claim capitalism doesn't account for them, which justifies uh, them to intervene with some policy to take proper account of the impact of the externality. I have never been able to come up with good arguments to refute this view of the economy. Surely capitalism doesn't need help of this kind. Can you provide an answer, which I am sure would benefit many of us? This is a great question. Uh, you know, the old Forrest Gump saying is, life is a box of chocolates. Well, actually, life is a box of externalities. Externalities 
positive and negative are all over the place and they're not understood well. And yes, negative externalities are a reason that uh, uh, people who are in favor of government intervention use these uh, facts, the, the negative externalities as a reason, a justification for intervening in the economy. But this is an important, or important topic. So I am also gonna set aside an episode to discuss this. Remember, life is a box of externalities. Very, very important to understand. There really hasn't been enough work done on it to really explain how it works and why we don't really necessarily have to uh, worry too much about negative externalities. Thanks for listening. Be sure to check out my website, economicpolicyjournal.com, where I write about the economy Monday through Friday. I post about economic policy, economic theory, economic personalities. And then I post more on Saturday and Sunday. I don't stop. That's economicpolicyjournal.com. I have a new episode of this podcast that comes up every Sunday, 11 a.m. Eastern time, 8 a.m. Pacific time. Thanks for listening. Talk to you soon.